This season of the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast is proudly supported by my music staff. You know, I'd hear students show up at my school and they were starting voice lessons and they'd go in the room and five minutes into it, I'd hear dun, dun, da, 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 dun, 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 you know, and they start all the same exercises. And I'm like, how can they be doing that already? <laughs> like, how do they know what this kid is even into? Do they like metal or do they like, you know, pop music? Are they into hip hop or, you know, classical? What is it like, you know, versus certain teachers would take that first lesson and really go deep with a student. Welcome to the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast, the place where teachers from around the world meet to share innovative ideas about music education. Listen and learn as we help you motivate your students, grow your income, expand your studio, and become a more creative piano teacher. Good day, everyone. It's Tim Topham here. Welcome back to Season 2, 2018 of the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast. You're listening to Episode number 129, and a special welcome to all my Inner Circle Piano Teaching Community members. Whether you're a new or old listener, and I don't mean your age, thanks for choosing to spend time with me. I'm committed to providing lots of value for you and your students and supporting your teaching and studio growth. Make sure you check out my Piano Teaching app by searching for Tim Topham in your favorite app store. Today's show notes and a full transcript are now available at timtopham.com slash episode 129. This is part two in our three-part series with the fantastic Danny Thompson, who you met last week. While each episode in this series stands alone in its own right, I do encourage you to listen to last week's episode if you haven't already done so. This week, our focus is on practice, especially how best to align your practice expectations to get the most out of your students, and why weekly practice might be the worst thing you could require of your students at certain times. Yes, this episode is likely to spark some controversy, but you know, I don't mind stirring the pot a little if I believe it's going to have a positive impact on your students. My guest today, who you met last week, is the co-owner of the Music Factory School of Music in California. In 2017, he started the Music Lesson Business Academy podcast. On the show, he talks about clarifying your message, search engine optimization, Facebook, advertising and marketing, branding, hiring and firing employees, building a music business academy, and literally everything to do with successfully running a studio, either small or large. And they're all topics which none of us get to learn in music school, of course. We'll talk more about that later on. But for now, Danny, great to have you back. Hey, Tim. It's been a while. <laughs> <laughs> great great to see you again. And uh, let's get straight Thank into you. today's episode. It's, it's a little bit, in fact, it's very controversial. Uh, it all came about um, out of a podcast that you did on your show, Music Lesson Business Academy, a highly recommended show. You had Dave Simon uh, on the show to talk about um, practice and some of the things that he'd learned by talking to his students' parents about expectations and practice. And then we did a little Facebook Live when I was over in Florida, although my connection was bad and I got stuck, thankfully, on a smiley face for like 20 minutes. (laughs) That's very funny. So the discussion was all about whether the practice expectations we set for students is actually helping or hindering our teaching businesses. So can you just give us a quick bit of background about how this discussion all came about? Well, I, you know, Dave and I had been talking a lot about retention, student retention, and, and I had kind of stumbled down this road of saying, you know, that students have to fall in love with it first. That's the first step that I feel needs to take place when they come into that lesson room the first time uh, with a teacher, whether it's guitar or piano or drums or anything. And it's very easy for teachers to kind of just get into the swing of how they teach every lesson. And they're also thinking about maybe how they were taught, um, forgetting that they are people that at some point decided music was going to be their life, you know? So their perspective when they say, well, this is how my instructor at Berkeley did it with me. You know, that they had already decided I'm going to be a piano player for life or a singer or whatever versus the 10 year old kid who's doing it for the first time. They haven't made those decisions. So to just go straight into, you know, I'd hear 
students show up at my school and they were starting voice lessons and they'd go in the room and five minutes into it, I'd hear dun, dun, da, 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 dun, 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 you know, and they start all the same exercises. And I'm like, how can they be doing that already? <laughs> like, how do they know what this kid is even into? Do they like metal or do they like, you know, pop music? Are they into hip hop or, you know, classical? What is it like? you know, versus certain teachers would take that first lesson and really go deep with a student to find out who they were so that they could get that process started of making a student fall in love with playing music. If they fall in love with it, you really, the rest of it's super easy, mm. right? And that kind of prompted Dave to go deeper with it and ask parents that question about what they expected and what they wanted to see their kids get from playing music. And that's kind of where the genesis of this whole thing came out. <laughs> so let's listen to the original clip now. So in this clip, this is Dave Simon. He's talking about what he discovered from asking his parents, uh, his students' parents, about their goals for their child in undertaking music versus other after-school pursuits. Have a listen. You know, I would, they would all say that their hope for their child as to what they would gain from this, you know, from soccer or from karate was that their child would experience some type of personal growth. It would impact their self, self-esteem. You know, they value teamwork. And then their fear was that their child would have a negative reaction and it could maybe have a negative impact on their self-esteem. And success was solely marked by happiness. If their kid was happy, they would continue on pursuing this this activity but with music completely different their hope was exactly the same consistently they all wanted their child um, to experience personal growth nobody said to me their hope was that their child would become a good musician and i think that's something worth noting no one said i am signing (laughs) up my child for piano lessons because i hope that they will one day become a good piano player their fear was um, that their child wouldn't practice and success would be determined by whether they practice or not. And um, many parents agree that if their child didn't practice, they would pull them from lessons. And I've also found out that many of uh, the families in my school have these agreements with their children that if they don't practice, they're going to pull them out of lessons. So I then, wow. from that point, um, challenge them on that. And here's um, kind of what what happened is I said to them, um, I said, well, why is your hope? Your hope is the same for, let's say, um, soccer as it is for music. But how come you mark success with soccer by your child's happiness? but they, you don't mark your child's success in music through happiness, but through practice. And they all said, um, well, in order to get good at music, you have to practice. And I would call them out on it and say, but you didn't say that was your hope. You didn't say that your hope was that they would get good. And you didn't say that was their hope of, or you wouldn't get good at that. They wouldn't get good at music. And when you talked about soccer, you never said your hope is that they become a good soccer player. And they, they, it kind of tripped them up. And I said, do yeah, you feel sure. that I said, do you feel that soccer is requires less skill than music? Um, you know, soccer, you could argue maybe it does. But I would then talk about baseball and say, look, if your child's the pitcher of the team, are you saying being a good pitcher requires less skill? And they just didn't know what to say. They I mean, I really silenced quite quite a few of them. And some of them said, well, isn't that what you're supposed to do? Don't you have to practice? (laughs) And what I have learned from all this, my conclusion is that our industry has a practice problem. It is the number one reason we lose students is because they're not practicing. And as educators, we buy into that. We say to our students, okay, this is your first lesson. I need you to go home and practice. Um, But I think the practice problem is, 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 I think it's a myth. And that music is only accessible through practice. I think perfecting music is only only is only a possibility through practice. But is music 
um, educators and studio owners, I think we have to ask ourselves, what is our goal? Is our goal to produce good musicians? I mean, yes. I mean, of course, we all are going to say yes to that. But is that our primary goal or is our primary goal to allow as many kids as possible access to music so they can experience the enrichment that music has? And if that is our if that is our primary goal to benefiting children's lives, we need to rethink practice. So let me summarize, uh, Danny, what, what I take from, from Dave's research and, and your discussions on the podcast about this. Um, I, I think my thinking is we all place practice expectations on our students when they begin their first lessons. And parents also put expectations on their children, stating things like, if you don't practice, we'll pull you out of lessons. But the interesting thing is that parents don't have the same approach for any of their other after-school activities that they enroll their children into, sport, dance, karate, soccer. Even though their desires for their child, of what they'll get out of the activity is exactly the same, which is personal growth, self-esteem, and the love of the activity. Have I sum- summarized that right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. And I, I think the key element that you know, that he struck on the one thing that really stood out is he asked people, what did you hope for your child to get from it? And most people just said, I just want them to enjoy it. You know, I know that there's something for them to gain from it. I want to make sure that they enjoy it, Mm -hmm. you know? So they're not saying I want my kid to be, you know, a top level pianist. You know, that's not their goal. They just want them to enjoy music. They didn't even say they wanted them to learn to learn to play even <laughs> really. <laughs> yeah. it's, just, it's just about love and uh, experience and growth. And, uh, and that's exactly what they expect from the other ones. So that's where we get this uh, disconnect between right. then the, all the parents uh, expecting all this practice when they don't expect it from soccer. But we know that when the kid loves soccer, he's going to start, he or she's going to start kicking that ball around the house, inside the house, outside the house, whenever they can. Yeah. Is soccer really the big sport in Australia? Wouldn't you, uh, wouldn't you relate it to a footy game? Yeah, it would be footy. <laughs> Australian rules footy. I'm, I'm glad you, you know that, Danny. How'd you know I've that? Been to, I've uh, been to footy games. Have you really? It's, yes. I, I've been in to the big stadium in Melbourne and watched the, uh, gosh, who played? Um, Collingwood? Yeah. And I forget who they were playing. Wow. But yeah. At the I've got M- a magpie hat and everything. <laughs> <laughs> the MCG. That's our biggest yes. stadium. It's huge. Yes. 100,000 people or whatever it is. There you go. I fell in, I've, I've totally taken this podcast in a different direction, but I fell in love with Aussie rules football. Wow. I'm really impressed because, <laughs> well, one, most people uh, have never heard of it. Two, most people don't understand it, so therefore don't really get it and, and enjoy it. So it's nice. <laughs> That's very, very cool. So look, since you uh, recorded this first podcast and you actually did a a series of two, uh, we did the Facebook Live, you've obviously been talking about it in your studio and sharing it, uh, talking about it with other teachers. What's happened since? Because that was a couple of months ago now. What I found is that some of the teachers were kind of already doing this. They already were approaching it from the standpoint of not putting so much pressure on people to practice. And um, other teachers, I'm still having to sit down with them because I'll hear them with a student. I know it's a new student that they're doing the wrap up at the end of the lesson and they're talking to the mom and they're saying words like, you know, homework, homework assignment, practice assignment, things like that. And, uh, I get it why it's tough for the teacher. And one of the things that I think is tough for the teacher, especially, you know, if you work for somebody else, and, and probably even if you're a, a solo teacher because, you're, you know, the parents are really kind of the boss in that situation. I think teachers try, are, are so worried about impressing the parents or impressing the school owner that they gotta, they're trying to jam all this teaching into 30 or 45 minutes. Look how much, you know, we're doing all these scales and we're doing all this stuff and they're trying to jam it all in there. And I know that they have all the best intentions. They're really trying to do the best and it's how they've taught at other schools and, you know, it's how it's been done for years. And to tell them that, listen, it's okay if all you guys do is you play, that kid goes home, they don't do any playing until they come back next week. That's okay at the beginning to Mm. do that. And uh, so one of the things that we did at the school is I made a video of just me talking about those things. And when we sign up a new parent or a new student, when that student is in that first lesson, I make the parent watch the video 
I have an iPad on the desk with a set of headphones and I go, hey, can you sit down? I want you to watch this. It's three minutes long. And it basically just talks about this idea that here's what we want your child to accomplish right now. We're not worried about them practicing at home. If they do, amazing. Encourage it. If they don't, don't worry about it. You know, it's going to come later. And just really the whole goal of this, and this is where I think everyone got it wrong when they listened to the podcast. We're not saying that it's not good to practice. Right. What we're saying is you have to change the expectation of what the parent is seeing or, or looking for. We want all our students to practice. I mean, everybody does. But we also know that that's not a reality that many of them are not going to at the beginning. Uh, you know, I, there was years, I can think of years, I took drum lessons from fourth grade all the way through high school, and a lot of it with the same teacher. I became a professional drummer. I tour the world. There was long periods of time where I didn't practice much. You know, I didn't go home and crack open the book that my teacher wanted me to do. I put a, a police record on and played along to it because that's what I <laughs> wanted to do. Right. You know? So, you know, do we want to discourage that? You know, I had a love for playing music and wanting to be in a band. We don't want to discourage that in, in people. So if they fall in love with it, if they enjoy it, the practice is going to come later. I hear, you know, there's teachers that, uh, you know, there's lots of discussions in the Facebook groups. There's teachers, I hear them all the time, you know, you know, talking about firing a student who doesn't practice, mm. you know, and I understand that it, it, it's, you know, if we think about the last podcast where we talked about brand identity, if that's part of your brand identity, that's fine. Mm -hmm. And that's the customer that you want to attract. And that should be part of your whole program is I only take students at this type of level that are this serious about things that could work, you know, but it, it all depends what your goals are. If our goal is to share music with as many people as possible, because we believe that that is a positive thing for people then maybe, you know, we take a different approach to it. I have to uh, give my own story about this. I've got a student who's been with me for probably around a year. Uh, he had just finished elementary school, primary school here, and moved to a really different high school and, and actually struggled a lot with that, the change to the high school. And, of course, when he came to his piano lessons, uh, it was like, oh, I have, I'm sorry, I haven't done any practice, uh, actually because he's really struggling at school and he's suddenly got so much homework and all this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the first few lessons, which I took before listening to your podcast, I was saying, uh, well, you know what? Well, why don't you try and do this and, and just a little bit of that and uh, it would be great to hear your progress next week when you've practiced this little bit. I listened to your podcast and after a couple of weeks and it was still the same uh, no practice was going on, I just said to him and his, 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 his mum, you know what? I'm just going to take this pressure off. He doesn't need it. He's got enough pressure in his life at the moment with other things. So I don't mind if he doesn't do any practice or touch the instrument at all because I know he's enjoying spending time here. He, he says he loves the lessons, so he's mm -hmm. enjoying that. We're making music and he'll get back on track later on and that's okay with me. Yeah. Uh, and it was just everyone was just able to go, oh, thank goodness, <laughs> we can just relax. Yeah. Uh, and everyone, while he might not be making that much progress, I've still kept a student who would otherwise leave and probably never come back. Uh, and um, and he's he's great, and he's really good fun to work with. So I I, I just hope other yeah. other teachers take on this. It's not just for beginning students, although that that's a great time to also yeah. think about this practice um, expectation, but also for students that just, as you said, you know, just have a bit of a break, and, or something else comes up in their life. Don't let them go. Yeah. I mean, that kid two years from now could have a total different take on the whole thing. That kid might hit some, something might, you know, strike him one day where he really goes to town that mm -hmm. he could be, you know, the next great piano player. You just don't know where that's going to come from. And I, I think that we have to, you know, and I don't want to sound a negative in saying this, but there's a, there's a little bit of arrogance in the music teaching world, you mm -hmm. know? And I think we got to let some of that go right. and, and realize, I mean, again, it all depends who you're trying to be. I know there's super hot, you know, 
I'm in the Los Angeles area, though. There's vocal coaches up in L.A. that are five hundred dollars an hour. Well, that's a different business, you know, and if that's who you want to be, then you build your business to be that way. But most of us, and especially if you are going to run a bigger studio, a multi teacher, you're going to have 20 teachers working for you. You need to build a business of 500 students or so, you know, it's going to be tougher to build, you know, to build that business if you're, if you're holding those kind of expectations on people, you know, and again, it, it, that's fine. It just all depends who you want to be, but parents, like you're saying, they come into it expecting, you know, when they feel relaxed because you took the pressure off, it's because they feel now that they don't, they're not disappointing the teacher. Mm. That kid felt like he was disappointing you. And those parents were worried, you know, even yes. though they're paying you, they were worried about disappointing the teacher. Mm. And you just removed all that for them. Right. And so they, they were like, this is great. Yep, you exactly. Know? So even just having that conversation with somebody just, you know, opens up that world for them. And again, we're not saying not to practice. We would never tell some, you know, we're not going to tell them not to practice. If they enjoy picking up that instrument and playing, well, that's great. Let's, let's encourage them to do that. Yep. And it was interesting in the next lesson that he came, he'd actually spent a whole lot of time <laughs> on YouTube, hadn't he? <laughs> so he'd been learning from, uh, by copying uh, the start of this thing I'd never heard of, which actually sounded kind of cool. And I said, you know what? Go, you go for it. That is just so good. Keep that up. I would love, <laughs> I'd love for you to do some of what we're doing, but that's okay. <laughs> you know, he's engaged with it and he spent hours and hours doing it. So it wasn't a matter of time. I think it was just the pressure was off. Uh, he knew I was flexible and so he was engaging with music. And, and I know a lot of teachers really shudder at the thought of their children or their students exploring Facebook and copying what people are doing and things. But you know what? We, we have to engage with that in our studios today. We're 21st century teachers. That is a reality. And actually, it's an ama amazingly engaging reality for many, many students. So hmm. really embrace it. When students come and they've learned something, I don't know what you do, Danny, but I, I, I listen to it and I give them feedback and, and see, you know, often they've used really awkward finger choices or whatever. Give them some help. Uh, encourage them to learn the next little section. Uh, I, I'm all for it. What about you? Yeah, I, I see that in students. I, I There's a, you know, a little singer. I, he's been at our school since he was five. He's 10 or 11 now. I mean, he's going to be a superstar. Yeah, he, he's got everything going. You know, he's got the performance. He's got the look. And, you know, he's never taken piano lessons before. But I see him. He'll go over to a piano and he'll be like, yeah, I figured out how to play this song off the radio. Doesn't know what he's, you know, he's just doing it because mm, he's mm. got that thing. And he does, you know, now he does guitar lessons and he's, you know, so take, you know, if a student comes in and, and they've started that process, that's a great opportunity to take that. And then you run with that mm, That's and, it, and, and use that as an, uh, as a way to, you know, you've found out they're sort of telling you at that point, this is what turns me on. This is what I'm into. Mm -hmm. And now, you know, because once you know, it's a lot easier to, to continue that process with them. That's right. Find out more about whatever it is that they're playing. See if you can find some sheet music that could help uh, that you could teach them in a different way. So there's, there's lots of opportunities there. I mean, I, I think everybody's probably had that experience where the student comes in and you say, well, what kind of, you know, what music do you like? And they name a band and it happens to be like one of your favorite bands, mm. you know? Well, that's all. It always seems like that one goes a lot easier. Yeah. Right. right? <laughs> <laughs> you know? So if you can find that, that common ground and those things that, that excite that student, you know, mm. you're going to be in a much better position. Now, a quick word from our sponsor, My Music Staff. My Music Staff is the most popular studio management software available to music teachers around the world. I've even written a blog post on how I personally used My Music Staff to transition to automatic monthly payments. All of my students now receive an automatic invoice each month and their credit cards are charged instantly. My Music Staff has become an essential part of my own studio and I've effectively been able to put my entire teaching business on autopilot. One of the great things about My Music Staff is that it scales with your studio. 
When you start growing your business, it doesn't mean more work for you. From student management to scheduling and billing, it offers you everything you need to manage your business with ease. There's even a student portal that allows students to notify you of any upcoming absences and even reschedule missed lessons without needing your input. It's a great solution for any teacher looking to improve their business and set themselves apart from their competition. Head to mymusicstaff.com to start your 30-day free trial today. And I just want to swing back to something you said about how you're educating parents about this approach. And uh, I, I do think it's important to keep parents in the loop if you are making a change or considering this. Uh, so I, I would never have um, just spoken to my student about, hey, yeah. you know what? No practice. is It's all cool. Make sure the parent is engaged in that. Otherwise, they will keep the pressure on and keep getting really worried that you're going to, you know, <laughs> let them leave the studio. So, uh, yeah, and and I think uh, as you're a music studio owner, you have multiple teachers under you. Obviously, it's important to keep the teachers in the loop about this too. Yeah. If, if you're thinking this way, that's probably the hardest thing, you know, is because some of my teachers teach at my school and some other school, you know, or they teach some students at their house and then they teach at our school three days a week. So. You know, getting them to do those things the way you that's a challenge, mm. you know, because, again, you're changing years of this, you know, process that everyone's sort of, you know, we've all done it the same way for mm-hmm. like 50 years or 100 years. This is how you do it. You come in, you do this, you go home, you got to practice, you come back. You know, that's been the way it is. So the parents are coming into it going, well, this is how it works, right? They got to practice. You know, this is what it's all about, you know, and giving them that different perspective of, you know, it's okay to do it like this for now. Mm. You know, it's a big change, a big mental shift for people. It's been a huge shift in my thinking and it, it takes a fair bit to shift my thinking, I have to say. <laughs> yeah. So you've, you've done a really good job and, and your podcast was very convincing. We'll make sure we obviously put a link in the show notes to your yeah. full episode. But I mean, whole- that one, this one, I, I really, you know, Dave is really the one that, deserves all the credit I think on this practice thing. He, 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 he's the one who really had the foresight to, to do the investigation, to determine what it was, and then really just put that stamp on it of like, listen to exactly what these parents said. This is the thing that we Mm. have to deal with, you know? So I I would really want to give him that, that credit. Absolutely. And we'll obviously link to Dave and his, I mean, he's got great teacher resources. He licenses programs for music schools. So make sure you check out Dave Simon. I think it's Dave Simon Music, but I will check that and we'll put yeah. it in the show notes. So uh, as, as kind of wrapping up this concept, uh, my feeling is that the, the change that teachers might want to consider in regard to our discussion today is from students must practice because that's what they need to do and it's what we've always got them to do. Over two, I actually need to motivate and inspire my students enough that they want to practice. And that's where I'm now focusing much more of my thinking about this. The student, If the student's not practicing, sure, there's there could be family issues, school issues, whatever it is. But right at the beginning stages, if you're taking on a seven, eight, nine-year-old, then Actually, that's not so much of an issue, generally speaking. So Mm -hmm. the question is, how do you motivate and inspire those students that they want to love it enough to practice it? And for me, that all comes down to the the lessons that are engaging. As you've said, finding out what they love and what's going to spark their interest the most. Making sure it's not just sort of getting out that method book in the first lesson. It's it's about engaging with music, helping them learn to play something fun, uh, those kind of aspects. And I I just wondered if, if you approach the instruction you give your teachers about those first lessons in the same way. Yeah, we, we actually kind of have a little process, uh, you know, it's on paper and, uh, my guitar instructor, my kind of director of the guitar division, Brian, who is probably one of the best guitar instructors in the country. It's been with us for seven or eight years at the school, you know, just amazing. I haven't given him a new student in about 12 months cause he has zero openings and nobody quits. You know, that's and that, that's, that's what a every music, teacher. <laughs> that's what Keep every him. music school owner wants, if, right? If right. he's listening, he can charge a lot more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and um, you know, so he kind of put a process together um, of what he does when he meets people for that first time. But there's another element to him, and I think this is a harder thing for people to to really think about: is the student 
part of that being inspired, and I think back to when I finally kind of clicked with my favorite drum instructor, a lot of it was that I just really liked him, you know, and I enjoyed, you know, I thought he was a cool guy. I wanted <laughs> to be more like him, you know, so I wanted to go spend that time with them. And I think that that's really important that they have to almost look up to you. You know, my, my guitar teacher, Brian, he's an amazing guitar player. You know, he plays in a cool local country band. He's a shredding guitar player. He teaches surfing in the morning. You know, he's got this long blonde hair. He's like this quintessential California guy, but really smart, you know, just on his game. He's a cool guy. Everybody likes him. People want to be more. So when a student who's 12 or 13 who's maybe struggling a little bit with who they're, who they want to be in their life and you know, going through all the things that, you know, the tough times that we all remember at that age, they come in and meet Brian. They're like, okay, I want to be more like this guy. He's got it going on. And I think it's, you can't underestimate how much that really impacts people. So the way that you present yourself to students, that likability factor, that inspirational personality, and that's a harder thing to certainly to learn or teach, but I think people can become, you know, you can work on that. Mm. That is something that you can, you know, desire to be better at as a teacher if you feel that, you know, I mean, most of the teachers, when you're running a multi-teacher school and, and I get a new guitar applicant, you know, a guitar teacher applicant, they can all play a Mixolydian scale. You know, I don't even know what that is. I'm like, <laughs> I'm a drummer. I don't even know what that is. All you guys say that. I really don't care. You all can play all that stuff. You're never going to show that to a student because, you know, they're, they're going to be long gone before they care about that. <laughs> you know, it's all the other stuff that really matters. They're all great guitar players when they come to try to be a teacher or piano players or singers or whatever. That's not really the, the, the issue. They're all teaching the same information. You know, the scale is the scale, right? So it's really how do you present the, the, the concept or the, you know, the theory and being a, pre, you know, an inspirational personality makes all of that stuff so much easier. Mm. How, as a music studio owner, do you find that out when you're hiring someone new? That's got to be yeah. really hard. So, I mean, th this could be a whole podcast in itself, but going back to our first podcast, the school has a very strong brand. Mm -hmm. So when a teacher goes to our website, we've got it. It looks like we have it going on. So instantly we attract a certain type of person. And um, that, that sort of weeds out some of the people in the process. And, um, you know, I've just developed a skill. I was successful at Guitar Center running retail stores because I hired really good employees and I trained them really well. And then I worked hard to keep them, to make them happy and, and keep them and mentor them uh, and, and provide good leadership. And I do the same thing at the school. I, I'm really cautious about who we hire. And I can get inside their head pretty quickly in an interview and get a feeling for who they are and what their philosophy is towards mm -hmm. teaching and their philosophy on life. And that tells me everything I need to know. Right. And occasionally we make a mistake and then I have to maybe let that person go and make a tough decision. But that's part of owning a business. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, we, you better let us around know what your studio website is so we can check out what your branding is all like. Yeah. It's uh, the music factory OC.com. Great. So I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the marketing side of things uh, briefly before. Have you got any other thoughts about how this what way of approaching practice and the expectations around it can be related to our marketing and branding? Sure. Um, so definitely this is something I've started to work more into the music factories branding. And I would bring it all back to, again, to a, a lot of this is learned through uh, the story brand process and through the story brand book. But one of the elements of that is showing people what failure looks like. You need to show them what the win looks like, right? Happy kid playing piano, that's the win. You also have to show them what failure looks like and explain to them what is the problem. Well, the problem with music lessons is that lots of kids quit. That's the problem. So it, you have to almost tell them, here's the problem. 
if you go somewhere else, you may experience this problem. But because we're aware of that problem, we've changed our approach and this is what you'll get from it. Your kid won't want to quit. And that means they'll stay with it. They'll get the benefits and the rewards of learning music and all the positive elements that come with that. And you as a parent will feel really good about that. Mm, fantastic. A great, great way to summarize things and to make it really clear in your branding. Again, as, it's, as yep. you said, it goes back to episode 129. Uh, if you haven't listened to the last episode with Danny, it's an absolute cracker. So <laughs> timtopham.com slash episode 128. Do you use the word cracker like I just used over there or is that an Aussie thing? Uh, no, that's not a good word. In oh, the is States. it? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, is that a bad, is a cracker a bad thing? In a that? cracker in the States is generally a term that you would call like a white racist person. Really? The cracker. Yeah. <laughs> Woo. Okay. Thank you, Danny. Uh, uh, <laughs> I'm not going to edit that out because it's quite funny, but I'll keep that in mind for future. <laughs> Okay. Good. Well, on that note, um, hopefully I'm adding some <laughs> liveliness to this podcast. You know, uh, I am two glasses of wine in, so <laughs> it's getting better as we go. <laughs> uh, and and wine, you, I have to tell everyone because it just makes my gut like churn. But are you still putting Coke in your wine or drinking it no, at the no, same no, time? No, no, no. Okay. Yeah. Let's let's clarify that. You don't mix red wine with coke zero Whew, it's, phew, okay it's um i thought you were doing like a so, shandy thing <laughs> no 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 i have heard of people doing something weird like that and I, I forget what it is that they mix but somehow along the lines i got in this habit of if i was drinking some red wine to drink a little bit of coke zero every once in a while in between the wine because it i feel like it kind of quenches your thirst and hydrates <laughs> you a little bit and cleanses the palate and a whole bunch of other people that have done it are also agreeing with me on it. So oh, I, I don't cannot know. cannot agree. If I didn't have headphones on, my fingers would be <laughs> in my ears, and I'm sure some people listening will be the same thing. Don't don't rule out Danny. He's a superstar. He's a beautiful guy, <laughs> uh, and uh, and we've got one more podcast episode coming up in this series. It's next week, and it's all about Facebook advertising. So uh, don't rule out his uh, his great ability to give you some good ideas just because of his wine drinking. <laughs> Um, and look, I did want to finish by saying um, I, I know there are going to be some teachers out there who've just listened to this episode and uh, can't quite get their head around what we're yeah. talking about, probably think we've lost the plot a little bit. Um, so any kind of final thoughts just to wrap things up, a, a, a takeaway for mm. those teachers perhaps? Yeah, I, I think everyone walks away thinking we're saying that we're saying it's okay or we're encouraging somebody to not practice. And that's not the case. All we're saying is for those beginner students to just take that pressure off, um, that it is okay for a beginner student to just learn in the lesson for a while mm -hmm. until they fall in love with it. If they fall in love with it and they keep coming to you, the practice is going to come. And obviously when they get to that point of, you know, becoming more of an intermediate student or starting to maybe want to pursue something with it, obviously they're going to have to put those efforts in. But it's a tough one. I understand why it's a tough one for a lot of teachers, but I think if they just experiment with it, they might really get some results that they really enjoy. Mm, and I think that would be the takeaway. Try it out. And, and I think this all comes back to as well for beginners in particular, it might mean that you don't teach middle C and reading in that first lesson. And if you really want to engage them and get that love happening, you'll be doing some other things. And so I would definitely check out for the piano teachers listening, uh, my notebook beginners approach, which is how I teach uh, my beginner students with no books for the first uh, 10, up to 10 weeks. Uh, and you can find out more at timtopham.com slash beginners with some free lesson plans and me showing you at the piano what I actually do. So uh, I think that's awesome. definitely a good approach. So Danny, I think we'll wrap it up there. Thank you heaps for all your great insight. Really enjoying this series and I can't wait to next week's episode. Thank you, Tim, so much. Go back, guys. Okay, so that episode may have given you more questions than answers. Um, if it's made you think at all about your expectations for practice, then I feel like we've done a good job as it doesn't actually matter whether you agree or disagree uh, or you're shocked or laughing. It's always great to rethink what we're doing and to make sure that whatever we do truly aligns with both our mission and our brand. 
If you'd like to continue the discussion, head to the show notes at timtopham.com slash one episode 129, where you'll find a link to the Facebook Live chat that I did with Danny and also with Dave, who did the original interviewing of parents. And uh, you'll be able to see some other people's comments. And you're also welcome to leave a comment on the show notes page itself by scrolling to the bottom. We had an awesome webinar last week on getting groovy with GarageBand. Thank you so much to everyone that joined. It was fantastic to, uh, to see so many people there. The course has now officially been released in my inner circle, so you can grab a membership today at timtopham.com slash community and find out just how easy it is to use this free software to engage, inspire, and motivate your students. And don't forget, if you're not a member and you would like to save some money, I do give a discount of $100 on an annual membership, which is locked in for the life of your membership, to you because you're podcast listeners. Uh, You can find out the details right at the very end of the episode. Next week on the podcast, we're back with part three with my series with Danny, and we're going to be talking all about Facebook advertising. If you've ever lost money on Facebook ads or perhaps don't yet use Facebook or haven't the foggiest about how it all works, then next week's episode is for you. We'll unpack why your campaigns might not be working. We'll talk about how to track the effectiveness of your ads. And we'll talk about questions like whether boosting posts actually works. I'm Tim Topham, and this is the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'll see you next week. We'll conclude this evening's entertainment. Oh, thank you. Thanks for listening to the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast. We'd love to help take your teaching to the next level as a member of our supportive community. Use the coupon Piano Podcast for $100 off an annual membership of Tim's Inner Circle today. To find out more, head to timtopham.com forward slash community.